your hands together for Jesus today. Amen. You guys ready for the word? Woo, doggies. Happy Mother's Day to all of our moms. Man, we just celebrate you, also known as you don't have to cook lunch today day, right? So, um, hey, want to remind you a couple of things, and, and you can get signed up for our, we send out a weekly newsletter every week to remind you of what's going on. Um, but starting Memorial Day, the last Sunday in May, all the way through July the 10th, and I'm gonna explain that, we're doing one service at 10 o'clock. So I know that's gonna knock about a third of you out because you ain't getting up that early, but do it anyway because you love the Lord. And so um, we, like, we didn't wanna, if we did 11 o'clock, then our nine o'clock people might be too late for them. Or if we did nine o'clock, y'all ain't coming. So we thought, well, we'll just split the middle and uh, it's gonna be fun. So after school's out, folks just kind of go on vacations, go camping and do all that stuff. And so uh, we just thought, hey, let's just, let's put everybody together in the same room and a lot of fun, a lot of energy. And I'm telling you, we've never had a summer like this at Hill Spring. Never have. We got some fun stuff we're going to do. So Memorial Day, that will be the first one. That'll be a 10 o'clock service, one service. Everybody can all be together. And then the month of June, we're doing a series. We haven't done anything like this since 2015. And we're doing a series called At the Movies. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a movie. We'll show some clips. We'll stop. We'll preach a little bit. Kind of sprinkle some biblical principle on top of that. Show another little clip and preach a little bit more. And so it's fun. And then the day is going to be kind of themed along with the movie that we're showing. For example, on June 5th, it's going to kind of be Western Day or whatever. We're, We're calling that Blue Ribbon Sunday. It's going to look like a county fair around here. There might even be pie eating contests and bobbin for apples. You don't want to miss it. That's on June 5th. And then June 12th, I'm most excited about this movie in this session. It's called Acts of Service Sunday. And we're not doing Acts of Service that day, but the theme of it in the movie is. And then June 19th kind of has a sports theme. We'll be eating lunch if you want to stay because we're having a tailgate party, kind of be team day. And then June 26th, you've heard of Christmas in July. Well, we're doing it in June this year. So we're going to have Christmas in June. So have a Christmas theme day. And it's just, it's just going to be a lot of fun. And then Saturday, July the 9th is our serve day. That's, our, that's one of our big things we do in the summer. And so we will have probably 25 to 30 projects all over this community. We want you to come. It's a half-day thing. We start about 8 o'clock. We're typically done by noon. And so that's our serve day. And then the following day, that Sunday, we're going to have one service at 10 o'clock. And we're just calling that Celebration Sunday. And we're going to celebrate serve day. We're going to celebrate all some of this other stuff that's going on. And then... Finally, back July 17th, because vacations are over and all that travel's kind of done, we'll go back to July 17th, we'll go back to a 9 and 11 a.m. service, and we are going to start a three-year walk through the book of Leviticus. You do not want to miss it. You don't want to, I'm only kidding. So anyway, book of Philippians, where we're at. So it's week 14 of Philippians, I know, because this book talks a lot about a lot of different things, and so we have just kind of slowly just kind of grind through that a little bit. It was a letter that Paul wrote to Christians in the southern Greek city of Philippi. And the overall theme of this book is how Christians, you and I as followers of Christ, how we can have a life of joy, a Christ-centered, spirit-empowered life of joy. All right? Here's what's been hard about this. Some of the things that Paul writes and tells them and ultimately telling us to do it goes against our natural tendencies. Like it goes against human nature. If I wanna have joy, I would think in order for me to be happy, I need to be selfish. I would think in order for me to be happy, I wanna put me first. But actually the thing that Paul says, he goes, no, 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 no. No, you actually need to put others first. This is how the kingdom works. And so just imagine living, if we did this in our homes, if we did this in our families, if we did it in our schools, if we did it in our workplaces, if we created the culture and the climate around us then I'm gonna put other people first. Well, baby, I just want you to be happy. No, baby, I just want you to be happy. Oh, sugar buns, I just want you to be happy. Oh, no, baby gums, I just want you to be happy. I mean, just imagine that being the culture that we create around us. Everybody gonna be happy, right? There ain't no fighting. And today, there's probably not a better passage, especially in Philippians, to preach on mothers. I think, I think you'll see that. Philippians chapter four, verse eight, just gonna do two verses today, eight and nine. It says, and now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing, fix your thoughts on what's true, what's honorable, what's right, what's pure, what's lovely, what's admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you've learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and you saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. Let me sum it up for you what he's saying there in verse eight and nine. Fix your thoughts on mama. 
right? You know what I'm saying? Because mama is pure, she's lovely, she's honorable, she's admirable, right? She's all those things. Just think about mama. Can I get an amen? He's actually, <laughs> he's actually saying if you want to have a life of joy, it starts with your thought process. It starts with what goes on between the ears. It starts with how you think. You need to guard your mind and the, the things that you allow your mind to think about. Be careful what you actually put into your mind. Be intentional about your thoughts. He comes at it in a different book, 2 Corinthians 10. He comes at it from a little bit different direction. He says this in 2 Corinthians 10, 5. He says, we break down every thought and proud thing that puts itself against the wisdom of God. Meaning, God's ways work every time. And in life, we're gonna encounter things that go against that. And he says, we, we gotta stop that. We gotta put that in. Anything that would go against what God's way, God's wisdom is for my life, we need to say, whoa, 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 stop. And then he says this, take hold of every thought. Some of the older translations say, take captive of every thought and make it obey Christ. Now, I don't, I don't know about you, but some days when people are having a bad day, it is so easy for to assume that it is about me, okay? Like you say, oh, good morning, and they don't even respond. And you're like, wow. And you start to declare war on them in your mind. You know what I'm saying? Well, I'm just not gonna be there. I'm not gonna put up with that. And no, my kids are not going to their, mm -mm, uh -uh. and then like you spend three hours planning their demise only for them to text you and say, hey, will you pray for me? We found out my grandma has cancer. And that's when you would crawl under the table, right? It's, it's easy for our minds to just kind of spiral out of control. Take your car to the mechanic and you think it's gonna be a $200, $250 issue and the mechanic tells you it's a $2,000 issue. <laughs> I wonder what debtor's prison's like. You know what I'm saying? You just thought, am I gonna lose my home, right? Which kid are we gonna have to sell to do this? It's just so easy when we hit adversity for our mind to just go to the negative and start to spiral out of control. My mind can automatically assume the worst. And my friends, that will rob you of your joy. That's what I say, that our natural tendency wants to go this way, but Paul says, hey, God's way is better. And we need to stop those thoughts, we need to put pause on that negativity, and we need to replace it with thoughts about mama. Okay, and he lists off actually about eight things, and we're gonna thumb through some of those today. But if you lose the battle of the mind, it affects everything else you do. If I lose the battle of the mind, it begins to affect how I see people. It begins to impact my relationships. If I lose the battle of my mind, it even impacts my relationship with God and chips away at my faith. God, why would you let this happen to me? God, I guess you just love everybody else. You just love them more than you love me. and You just bless them with everything. And my life is so hard. And it's so easy if you lose the battle of the mind to become a victim or turn into the victim mentality. And it all begins with what we let our mind focus on. That's why in 2 Corinthians, Paul said you have to stop. You have to take captive those thoughts. No, I'm not gonna let my mind go there. So here's the biblical principle that I think Paul is teaching in 2 Corinthians and in Philippians. Resist and replace. When those negative thoughts come, stop. I resist it. But then I've got to replace that destructive thought, that destructive emotion. I've got to replace it with something better. That's why he says, think on these things, okay? And let's be honest, this passage really kind of teaches itself. Like, you don't have to guess what the next blank is. You can just look at Philippians 4, 8, because he just walks down this list of eight things, okay? And I, it's just right there, it's in the text. But I want to look at the essence. I want to look at the reason for the idea that Paul says you need to focus on true, you need to focus on honorable, okay? So there's eight words listed, but I'm, I'm only gonna, for the sake of time, gonna focus on six. And before you accuse me, well, he did, that preacher don't preach the whole word. Listen, I'm just telling you, it's mama's day, and she don't wanna be here all day, she wants to go to lunch. Can I get an amen, mama? A little too loud, but okay. Philippians chapter four, verse eight. Now, brothers and sisters, one final thing. He's, he's circling the plane, baby. He's Round and third, headed home. He's wrapping up this letter. One final thing, fix your thoughts. I wanna focus on that just a second. And it's interesting, some of you, may, this may be a very familiar verse to you. Like, I don't remember it that way, 
but you maybe have memorized it, or it's just very familiar to you. And, and I got to tell you, I typically read and, and preach out of the New Living Translation, and it changes the order of the wording, not the placement of the words, but it, it kind of changes for emphasis how it writes the sentence, okay? At the beginning, it says you need to fix your thoughts on, and then the list. But the older translations give the list, and then it just says, think on these things. I don't know. I don't know why the New Living decided to put it at the front while they rearranged the sentence. I think as they went back to the original wording and the word think has such an emphasis on it. Let me, let me just, for the sake of not boring you, in the original Greek, the word think, in Greek was the language this letter was written in, the word was actually logizimi. Like a little boom, right? Just make it tell you fake it, right? So that was the Greek word, logizimi. It can be translated think, but it can also be translated count and recount. Or count and count again. Or think and rethink. Think and keep thinking. It can also be, there's one of the definitions of this logizomy is decide. Determine. Make a decision. Okay? So yes, its original word does mean think, but if I could kind of make it wordy or give you the essence of the word Paul specifically chose for this moment, this would, this would probably be a better, wordier, bigger working definition. Make the choice. Determine to think and think again about these things. Because it don't just happen. It is actually a discipline to train your brain. Because my default is to think negative. My nature is to just get down in the mud pit of the messy. But Paul uses a very delicate action word here. He says, listen, you need to make up your mind. You need to make the decision that I'm gonna think and rethink. I'm gonna count and recount. I'm gonna determine that I'm gonna keep thinking on these things. Verse eight, now dear brothers and sisters, one final thing, fix your thoughts. Think, rethink on what's true. And I want you to pay attention because I'm not gonna keep putting this verse up. I'm just gonna walk through the word, okay? You wanna follow along, you can open your Bible or turn it on on your phone or whatever, but just, just grab hold here. I, I'm, whatever's true, whatever's honorable, whatever's right, whatever's pure, Whatever is lovely and admirable. No mention of Texas Longhorns. Can I get an amen? Right? Okay. And then so he says, think about these things that are excellent and praiseworthy. So he's got eight different things dum, 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 that he's thinking. So I'm just going to walk through most of them. Number one, whatever is true. He starts with that one. Whatever is true. So I would say if there's a chance it's not true, then don't give it the time of day. This will help you when it comes to worry because it is so easy to play, well, what if? What if our kids grow up and go crazy? What if we lose them? What if? What if? It's so easy to play the what if game. And what Paul is saying, hey, it, only focus on it if it's true. And that'll, that'll really help some of the worry stuff. I, I would say if there's a chance it's not true about someone, don't entertain it. Have you ever had somebody give you some juicy information about somebody? It just didn't make sense. It just didn't add up. Like I've never had that experience with them. I don't, what you're telling me doesn't, reconcile with the person I see them as, right? It's most likely because the juicy information has bad intention or it's a half truth. So when, when I was a kid and as a 47 year old man, I'm a huge George Strait fan, always have been. My grandparents uh, lived in Daisy. If you don't know where Daisy's at, Google Maps will take you there. It's right on the Indian Nation Turnpike straight south of McAllister, and that's where my grandparents, their cattle ranch was, and so they had two boys, my dad and my uncle. I'm the youngest of five grandkids and the best looking. <clears throat> and so there were a lot of weekends that some, if not all of us grandkids would end up out there. I mean, we, just, we had a blast. I mean, we had the whole place, motorcycles and Jeeps and ponds, and I mean, we just, so there's a lot of weekends, Daisy's a fun place to be. And so sometimes my dad, my brother and I'd be out there, and my uncle, and his three kids, we'd all be out there. And, and, and of course, we're kin to everybody in the valley, right? And so some of my grandma's kinfolk, they lived in Atoka, but on occasion, they would come out on Saturdays too, especially when all of us kids were there. And there was 
I, I don't know, it's kind of one of those, he was my third cousin twice removed type deal. I don't even know that I'm kin to him, but my granddad used to say, your cousin Greg's coming. All right, so Greg's coming. And he was about my age. And so we would actually end up just kind of buddied up together and we would play together. And, and so one weekend, counselor said, I'm gonna be all right. One weekend, he goes, man, you know what I heard? I heard George Strait has AIDS. I wept. Now, back in 1985, we didn't know anything. I mean, it was very scary. You know what I'm saying? And it like took my breath away. No, no, no. Greg would have no reason to lie to me. I'm devastated. And after all the folks left, my grandmother observed that something wasn't right with me. And I told him, Grand, you told me that George Strait has AIDS. He's gonna die. Honey, his mama says he tells a lot of little fibs. Are you sure? Are you sure? Brother stole my joy. Listen, if there is a chance it is not true about somebody, don't give it the time of day. Amen, everybody? There's also, if, it's, if there's a chance it's not true about myself, then don't give it the time of day. Because for some of us, it is so easy to believe the negative about ourselves. I guess I'm just always gonna be a failure. I guess my daddy was a drunk, I'm gonna be a drunk. I guess I'm just always gonna be poor. I guess our marriage is always gonna be unhappy. It is so easy just to buy the lies of negativity about ourselves. Let me tell you what, let, let, me, let me tell you what the truth is, not the lies that the enemy throws at you. Genesis 127 says that you and I are created in the image of God. Ephesians 2.10 says we are his masterpiece. You are not a mistake. Philippians 1, 6 says, he ain't done working on you. You've got some ways to go. You ain't perfect, but God's not finished with you yet. Amen, everybody? 1 Peter 2, 9 says, we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. We are God's chosen people. Jeremiah 29, 11 says that God declares the plans that he has for you, not your past, not your failures, and not the lies that get thrown at you. Amen, everybody? So only deal in truths and don't tolerate anything else. He says, whatever's true. Then he says, whatever is honorable. Some translations use the word noble. Ask yourself this question. Is this line of thinking the right thing to do? Is doing this the right thing to do? So if you ask that question, then I'm just gonna stay away from gossip because it's the right thing to do. I'm just gonna stay away from negativity. Is this the right thing to do? I'm gonna stay away from complaining and arguing and talking about other people because it's the right thing to do. Listen, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish. I wish there was some kind of scopey thing that I could show you on the inside what happens in us when we do all that stuff, when we gossip, when we're negative, when we complain. You know, at first, oh, it feels so good. Oh, it's just so nice to have a safe place to vent. Finally, I found people who think like me. But 1 Peter 5, 7 says, give all your worries and cares, cast your cares on the Lord because he cares for you. He can handle it. So coworker, classmate, someone frustrated you, go to God, not your bestie, because he can handle it. You fighting with your spouse, your spouse made you mad, go to God, not your mama. Because God can handle it and God can help you. Why wouldn't I go to the one person that can do something about it instead of my bestie? Because all I'm doing is robbing her joy too. So if someone gossips to you about someone, they're gonna gossip about you to someone else. Think on honorable things and the unsaid thing there is don't do the dishonorable. You want a life of joy? Pursue the honorable, amen? So whatever's true, whatever's honorable, then he says this, whatever is right. We haven't done this in a few weeks, so I feel like it's appropriate. We're gonna be interactive here for just a moment, need some crowd participation. Everybody repeat after me. I love tacos. I said that with some love, come on. Let's try it again. I love you, Brent. Y'all were more excited about tacos. 
let me, let me give you some advice for living life in 2022, okay? And I love you, and I will not fight with any of you about this. I won't, I won't fight about political hot buttons. I won't fight about big social issues. But I will, when it counts, stand up for what's right in the right position. But I wanna, I wanna give you some advice. Don't let emotions cloud your morality. I'm gonna say that again. Don't let your emotions cloud your morality. Now let me, let me explain that for you. There are people that you love. They're your friends, they're your coworkers, they're your cousins, whatever. You know them, maybe you grew up with them, you know they have a good heart, but their lifestyle and their choices and some of their actions are immoral. Don't let your emotions, and I'm not talking about romantic feeling, don't, don't let your fondness of this person, I, I know them, I know they have a good heart, right? But don't let your emotions cloud your morality. And here's the deal, we live in a day and a time where daily we are bombarded in shows, in movies, in news stories, in music, in social media, that constantly says, that behavior's okay. I don't, See what's wrong with it. It's not hurting anyone. But it goes against God's way for our life. It goes against God's word, what it says about our life and our values and our morality. I can't explain it. I'm just here to tell you, Paul is saying it will rob you of your joy. It will rob a society of joy. I love you. And you may not like this, and you may not come back, and that's okay. Listen, God didn't call me to grow a church. God called me to preach the word of God. And we live in a day and a time that has said, well, I don't see what the big deal is. It's not hurting one. I don't, I don't see what's wrong with it. But the end result of that is we have a generation of kids that don't even know what gender they are. And they don't understand God's given identity that he has for them, and they are massively depressed, and they are crazy confused. And I'm telling you, it's because as a society, we have neglected what is right. I love you. And I know, I know, I know, you want your kids to just be happy and you're afraid you might lose them. But what you do not correct, you silently condone. We've bought into the, if I want it, I can do it. And if it makes me happy, What difference does it make to you? And that line of thinking has led us down a depressed and anxious and hurting empty road. Guy in the Bible that went the same path, named King Solomon, he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. And in Ecclesiastes 2, 10 and 11, he said, if I wanted it, I took it. I pursued pleasure. What's interesting about verse 11, he said, after I had all that, it was empty. God has called you and I as Christians. He's called us as the church. He's called us as families to be children of the light. Do not neglect what is right. Because we have, and it's costing us our joy. Whatever's true, whatever's honorable, whatever's right. The next word would be pure, but I'm gonna skip it because the, the sense of purity, it's captured in the essence of a lot of these words. So I'm just gonna jump to lovely. He said, so whatever is lovely. Again, I'm just doing six of the eight words for mama, okay? So the Greek word for lovely is only used one time in the New Testament. It's right here in Philippians chapter four, verse eight. It's only used one time, right here. This word, lovely, you know what it means? Lovely. I mean, it's just pretty simple. Like, I I, I get geeked out. I love studying the original language because a lot of times they will take two words, and, and, and most of our words in the English language are a combination of two words that, that come together, like all and y'all and all y'all. You know what I'm saying? There's two words they put together. A little bit different in the Greek here, but like this word lovely, this is what the Greek dictionary that I read, this is what it said about this word lovely that's only used one time in the Bible. It said it is presumed to be a combination of the word with Affection. So it was just kind of this combination. It took the Greek word with and the Greek word love or affection and, and they put it together and so it's presumed to be with affection. Here's what Paul's saying. Think about, think about things you enjoy. 
Think about things you're fond of. And don't let the haters hate on you. It don't matter what they say. Don't let the naysayers be a distraction for you. Think It's okay to think about things you enjoy. Think about people that you enjoy. When you get all discouraged, it's all right to have something to look forward to. Think about the gifts, the talents that God gave you. Whatever fond emotions you have, think on these things. Hey, it is absolutely okay to do things that refresh you. Mom, it's okay to take a nap today. Can I get an amen, somebody? It's okay to do the things I enjoy. I'm fully convinced. I know it's Mother's Day. I know it's weird to talk about this, but I am fully convinced Jesus liked to fish. I mean, think about who he chose to hang out with. A bunch of fishermen. I think Jesus liked to cook. I think he enjoyed cooking. I mean, at the end of one of those gospels, when, you know, the disciples were out fishing, and this was before he's, you know, ascended up into heaven, they're like, I think Jesus is over there, and he's over there, he's cooking. It's okay, it's okay to enjoy things and do things that refresh you. And honestly, there's a principle here. Slow your life down a little bit and put something in it that you look forward to because that will help you in the difficult days. So whatever's true, whatever's honorable, whatever is right, whatever is lovely, the number five, whatever is admirable or of good report, some translations say. And honestly, there's there's lots of variations. I use a web page that pulls up all the different English translations, and some say admirable, some say good report, some say good reputation, right? Here's, here's the idea when you dig into the, to the language of it. If, if it will damage your reputation, don't go there. If it will damage how people see you, don't go there. 1 Thessalonians 5.22 says this, abstain from all appearance of evil. Some of the newer translations just say abstain from evil, but the older translations add some verbiage to it. They say abstain from the appearance of evil. Not just stay away from evil, but if it looks like. I just wouldn't go there. So focus on things of a good reputation because a bad reputation is sure hard to overcome. And then he says, whatever is excellent. And he goes on to say, worthy of praise. Just, I wanna kind of wrap up here with whatever is excellent. I mean, give God, give life, give it your best. Don't look back on your life and, and regret, boy, I wish I'd, have, wish I'd have tried a little harder. Boy, I wish I'd have given just a little bit more. Boy, I, I wish I'd have been a better dad. How about be a better dad, dad today? Well, I wish I would have been a better husband. I wish I'd have been a better wife. How about be a better spouse today? Well, I wish we would have tried just one more time. Okay, then try today. Well, I wish I would have been a better student. I wish I would have stayed in college. Okay, then how about be a better student today? How about go back to college today? Be better today for the glory of God. Let me show you too in Colossians chapter three. Work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. So you got a boss you don't like, you in a company you don't run, then sub out. You're not working for them anyway. Act like you're working for the Lord. That would change some things. Work for the glory of God. It is absolutely great to be successful. Matter of fact, if I will leverage that correctly, it brings glory to God because when his people do things with excellence, when his people succeed, it makes other people look and go, man, what you got? How come you're so happy? How come you're so successful? And you say, listen, let me tell you, it all begins because Jesus is the center of my life and it brings glory to God. Do you know him today? Listen, we already did that. I love you BK thing, right? Remember that? All right, all right. So, I mean, you're not coming back anyway. You might as well go there. If you claim to be a Christian business, you better do it with character and integrity and grace and excellence. There is nothing worse than someone that uses the name of Christ as a marketing tool and they don't operate in character and integrity and they don't do a job with excellence. Listen, Christian businesses, Christian employees, you need to give it your best. You need to give it excellence. And there's just something so fulfilling 
about giving it your best and a job well done. A buddy of mine, his daughter qualified for the state track meet and that was going on on Friday and so I knew they were there and I just texted him, I said, man, how's it going? And he told me that his daughter had placed 13th place in the 300 meter hurdles to which most of us would go, oh man, I'm, I'm so sorry, buddy, maybe next time, right? But not her. <laughs> she was fired up ecstatic, because number one, she got to go to state. That's awesome, right? And then number two, she ran in the 300 meter, meter hurdles, and the time that she ran that race on Friday was her personal best. She broke her personal record, and she was so fired up. She'd never run it that fast before. She didn't care where she placed. Sure, she would have absolutely loved to have won the gold, but she gave it her best and she trusted God with the rest. So don't focus on your failures. Don't focus on what everyone else has and what you don't have. You focus on where God has you, you give it your best, and you trust God with the rest. Amen? So whatever's true, whatever's honorable, whatever's right, whatever's lovely, whatever's ever good report, whatever's excellent, and I know that he also lists pure and worthy of praise, but for time's sake, gotta beat the Methodist Damasios today. So for time's sake, let, let's look at verse nine. He says, keep putting into practice all you've learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. And here Paul talks about this idea of discipleship. Keep doing what you saw me do. When I was with you, do those things. You saw me pray, then pray. You saw me encourage people, encourage people. You saw me love, then, then love. the things you saw me do, do. They didn't have the Bible. They had this letter, but they didn't have the Gospel of John or the book of Revelation. Or They didn't. They just had this letter. And they had Paul when he was there. They didn't have a Beth Moore Bible study. They didn't have version that had all these reading plans. They just had Paul for a while, and then he left. And then they just had some leaders that were prayerfully trying to get it right. Did they make mistakes? Yes, but they were just humbly trying to do the right things. And so here's the takeaway I want to focus on, Philippians chapter 4, verse 9. We want what others have. We just don't want to do what others do. Like we look at other marriages and we're like, well, he just got lucky. I mean... If I was married to her, I'd be happy too. Oh, she just married Mr. Wright. He's so kind, and mine's just that. Like, we want a happy marriage like they do, but we also want to gripe about that. We want to nitpick in his ear. We want to be selfish. I want to always get my way. I want to be right all the time. You can be right or you can be happy, but very rarely can you be both. I'm going to get that in you. We'll get that in you. We want to lose weight, but we want dessert. <laughs> and that 132-ounce Dr. Pepper, you can get down there to Quick Trip, right? We want to be respected, but we want to gossip and be critical and gripe. It's going to fit until I get my way. And we want to have joy like Paul had but we also believe lies and half-truths about other people and ourselves. We also listen to gossip and negativity way too quick. We're also too busy to have something in our life that refreshes us. We also wanna make sure things go our way. We've also compromised in too many areas of our life. We want the joy that Paul had. We just don't wanna do what Paul And then Paul makes this promise. If you by any chance were here last week, it's, it's gonna sound pretty similar. There's some swapping of words, but it's gonna sound pretty similar to last week. And if you weren't here last week, I'll just take a minute and re-preach that. No, I'm just kidding. Um, verse seven last week says like, if you'll put other people first, if you'll stay eternally focused, see things from God's perspective, if you'll replace worry with prayer, and, and, and if you'll be thankful, all that, then it says this, verse seven, then, if you do all that, then you will experience God's peace. You'll experience God's peace. You'll experience 
God's peace, which exceeds anything you and I can understand. And then it says, his peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus, okay? So he says, you'll experience God's peace and it will guard your heart. This week, he lists off all these things that I need to retrain my brain. I need to know if it's true, if it's honorable, if it's right, if it's pure, if it's excellent, it's lovely, good reputation. And then he says this in verse nine. So keep putting into practice all, when I was there, what you saw me do, you do that. It's discipleship, right? Everything you heard from me and you saw me doing, you keep doing those things. Then, if you think about these things, if you do the things that I trained you to do, then the God of peace will be with you. So up in verse seven, he says, you'll experience God's peace. Here, he said, then the God of peace will be with you. What's the difference? Verse seven, experience and guard. Verse nine, it'll be, okay? So in verse seven, the word guard's a military term, and it literally is to describe to keep a hostile invasion out, right? Like it's protecting your heart from being invaded with all those negative things. Like it's to guard, it's to prevent a hostile takeover. Verse nine says you will be, like you'll just be, have, possess, inherit. Also find it interesting that in verse seven, it said you'll experience God's peace, but in verse nine, it says you'll have God of peace. You can experience or you can be. Why car lots want you to drive a fancy new expensive car because they want you to experience. Oh, you feel how smooth that is? Oh yeah. Look at that fancy little screen up there. I think that thing's making brownies for me right now. You know what I'm saying? It knows I'm sweating. It automatically turned the air conditioner off. Like they want you to experience the car, but when you sign the papers, baby, and he throws you the keys and you drive it home and you pull it in your garage and you close that door, oh, it's yours. Like even before you go to bed, you just kind of go peek on it one time. Cat, get off that car. Get out of it. Somebody kill the cat, right? Scratching up my car. There's a difference between experiencing the test drive or it being your car. I want you to be, I want you to have the peace. Yes, you, you gotta do these things. You gotta focus your mind, okay? But all that begins with a relationship with your creator. All that begins with Jesus being the center of your life. Hey, thanks for watching this sermon on our Hill Spring YouTube channel. If you enjoyed it, take just a moment, hit that subscribe button. That way you won't miss a single thing. Secondly, if this message has impacted you and you want to help reach others, visit our website at hillspring.tv. Hit that Give Now button to help us carry the hope of Christ around the world. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.